and it's titled, but it may not make any sense, uh, Forgive and Forget. So I'm going to start in the New Testament, and we're going to talk about Paul. Paul the Apostle uh, had an interesting early career, and he did some things that he was not happy about later on. Uh, and let's read 1 Corinthians 15, 9. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. And for I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Now, Paul mentions this at least four times in the New Testament, three other spots. We don't need to read every one of them. So my question is, was it wrong of him to remember this and mention this? Was he looking for sympathy? I don't think so. He was just a realist. There was a problem. He repented and moved on. There was another man in the New Testament by the name of Judas. Let's turn to Matthew 27, start at verse 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. The response is interesting, but not abnormal. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to it. That's your problem, buddy. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. So had he really repented? Well, this word repented here can mean uh, depressed or sorrowful. Had he repented to God? I, you know, I don't know that I know the answer. But the fact that he went and hanged himself certainly leaves it in a bad situation, doesn't it? So we have two different men in the New Testament who did things they shouldn't have, and one of them obviously repented, and the other maybe not. Obviously, he was in depression and sorrow, and he let that get the best of him. All of us have sinned, right? I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. <laughs> and you got to grow and move on. Paul did, Judas didn't. So some of the issues that might come up with this are in Romans uh, 14 and verse 13. Romans 14, 13. Which starts with, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. So they were having troubles with this judging. And you know, we're, we're, we're kind of like that. We, we like to, whoa, I wouldn't do that. Are you sure that's right? Maybe we might even get more serious than that. But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block for an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So be careful. Don't work at causing somebody to fall, instead use love, right? Let's look at another one about the stumbling block, Re Revelation 2 and verse 14. Revelation 2, 14. This is an extreme example, which says, but I have a few things against thee. He's talking to the third church here, the message is to the seven churches. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctor doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So you don't necessarily get this in the Old Testament stories of this, but Balaam did end up helping Balak to curse Israel. How? To help them to stumble and fall. He taught Balak how to make them get, go against their God. 
So did Balaam know what he was doing? Do you suppose he ever collected his prize from Balak? Hmm, don't know, maybe. But you can check to see what prize he collected from God. He didn't survive, did he? So if I have a weakness and you exploit that just to make me fail, that's a problem. Obviously, if I fail, that's my problem. But you can join in that by helping me to fail. Were the Israelites justified to eat things sacrificed to idols just because Balaam told them to? No, no. They were not justified. Their sin was still their sin, no matter the enticement. We must forgive cleanly and completely. But does that require forgetting? Let's turn to the New Testament, Matthew 6. We all know these verses well. And verse 12. Matthew 6, 12. Here's a, one that I remind myself of often. And I'm glad I remind myself of it often because I need to. If I'm honest, I can just tell you plainly, I'm judgmental. And all of you that know me, I, uh, you know, my brain goes negative way too easy. I have to fight that. But I can fight it. And here's how. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I bring that to mind and, and, and I reset. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I need to be forgiven. I guess I'd better handle this right. Skip to verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. I like that. That's encouraging to me. I can follow that. Verse 15. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Wow. Okay, then. I know what I have to do. Another good example, Matthew 18. Matthew 18, starting at verse 21. <clears throat> Another one that we have read once or twice. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? That's, to me, it seems a reasonable question. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Four hundred and ninety times? Could you possibly keep track of that? No, you couldn't. But this is the closest that I came to finding a verse that says that a man should forgive and forget. How long... What's the point of this? How long, how long suffering is love supposed to be? There's no limit, is there? There is no limit. Because you aren't going to be able to accurately count to 490, and that's not the point, is it? It's just that love needs to be totally long suffering, and we can't judge. One thing I may have had the wrong on this verse in the past is that for the same sin. No, it doesn't say that, does it? Not necessarily. Sin totals. But maybe I could add up 490 in a lifetime. No, <laughs> not the point. So is the next lesson in the same context related, starting at verse 23? Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. That's a large sum, a lifetime's worth. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Wow. Okay, buddy, you got to pay up. You agreed to, so let's do it. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him 
and forgave him the debt. It's not that he said, okay, you can make payments. He forgave him the debt. This is big. It was a big debt. Verse 28, but the same servant, so that guy who just was forgiven a lifetime's worth, went out and found one of his fellow servants, which hold him and owed him an hundred pence. What, what is that? A month or two of wages? I'm not sure what it was exactly. It's a significant debt, but nothing compared to a thousand talents. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. You know, debtor's prison, isn't that a funny thing? How do you pay it if you're not allowed to work anymore? Because you're in prison. I, I, I never have understood that concept. I don't know. Maybe it's something about communism versus capitalism. But at any rate, how was his reaction compared to the man whom he owed money to? The king had compassion, and this guy had none. Reading on. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. Yeah, we would be, wouldn't we? Oh, man, look, look what that guy did. How judgmental is that? <laughs> and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredst me. So had the king forgotten? No, he hadn't forgotten. He had forgiven, but not forgotten. Verse 33, Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant? even as I had pity on thee. And it's, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and his, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> and his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So the king reversed himself because of his actions. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So this comparison is made to carry clear down to us. We can forgive cleanly, but it doesn't say to forget, does it? So can we ever not forgive? No, can't. Sometimes we think we can because we think we can read their mind. Oh, you've done this before. You're going to do it again. Is that allowable? No, it's not. Because we need God to forgive us. Have we ever repeated a sin? <clears throat> so, thank you, Zane. <laughs> Much better. Thank you. <clears throat> so what part does repentance play? Luke 17, verse 3. Luke 17, verse 3. Take heed to yourself. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Now, does this fit into the previous verses in Matthew? Of course it does. So my questions, what if he doesn't repent? What if he leaves the faith because you rebuked him? Is it your fault? If you didn't do it in love, maybe. Maybe. But if you loved him and did the best you could, is it still your fault? The command is to rebuke in order to save his soul. So if you don't, because you're afraid that he's going to leave, if you don't because you're afraid, have you broken the commandment of God by not rebuking? 
Why is it that we're more afraid of hurting someone's feelings than obeying God's command? This has got to be one of the hardest things to do. Am I wrong? No, I'm not wrong. Very, very difficult. <clears throat> it's much easier to let it lie, isn't it? Much easier. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 5, starting at verse 11, we read a situation here that we're familiar with. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. That's a rebuking, isn't it? For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So they're not judging thoughts of the heart here, but actions realities. That's when rebuke is appropriate. Just because I think, or you think you know what I'm thinking, <laughs> that's, not, that, that's not where it goes. <clears throat> now, obviously, when we refer to this story, we have to read 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 7 also. 2 Corinthians 2, 7. which is, so that contrarywise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such an one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. So once repentance is made, we're obligated to say, good job, brother. And no more rebuking. Is it forgotten? Of course it's forgotten. But not gone. You're not going to continually bring it up, are you? You just that would be totally inappropriate. Forgiven and put away. <clears throat> because if the person really is sincere in their faith to God, that would be tough on them. And we don't dare do that. <clears throat> Old Testament, Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. Deuteronomy 4, 9. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. What things? What things had their eyes seen? They had seen their fellow brethren sin and be punished. And they were supposed to teach that to their children and their children's children. So, were the sins ever gone? Well, they were forgiven, but not forgotten in such a way that it's not in existence anymore, is it? Let's back up to verse 2, and it explains what their eyes had seen. Verse 2 and 3. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor, for all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. <clears throat> so they have to remember the sin that Baal Peor was, the men did, and the fact that the men were no longer there. Later on in Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 7. Deuteronomy 9, 7, which says, Remember and forget not how thou provokest 
the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until ye came unto this place. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord. So Moses is reminding them that they've continued to be rebellious to God. In fact, it's kind of a interesting and sad story. They sinned, repented, sinned, repented, etc. Shouldn't Moses have forgotten their sin after every repentance? Well, it was just a fact, wasn't it? And to mention it again when they weren't doing well was a thing that was going on here. You guys need to get it straight. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 8 and verse 12. Deuteronomy 8, 12. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, ooh, what's this going on about? And when thy herds and thy flock multiply, and silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, they're doing well. Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and say in thy heart, oh, skip to verse 17, I'm sorry, from 14 to 17. <clears throat> and thou say in thy heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Yeah, I'm doing all right now. I can forget God now. Doesn't work well. Doesn't work well. And let's read some more, in, not in Deuteronomy at this time, Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23, starting at verse 38. They complained about the burden of the Lord, didn't they? <clears throat> but since ye say the burden of the Lord, therefore thus saith the Lord, because ye say this word, the burden of the Lord, and I have sent unto you, saying, ye shall not say, the burden of the Lord. Maybe you shouldn't complain. Why? Verse 39, Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you and will forsake you and the city that I gave you and your fathers and cast you out of my presence. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you and a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. So God says he'll forget Israel, but did he? No, I think we have to learn something about terminology here. The words forever and perpetual have an indefinite meaning, not eternal meaning. They were forgotten, they were put aside. But later in Jeremiah, over a dozen times, Jeremiah talks of a returning remnant after this point in time. And now we're here and witnesses to that has happened, and we believe it's going to happen even more. And of course, in the millennial, what's going to happen? They're all going to return. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I will utterly forget you is a punishment, but it doesn't mean forever. In fact, Let's read another one like that, Hosea 4 and verse 6. Hosea 4, 6. Which says, my people are destroyed. Were they destroyed? They were punished heavily, but they were not completely destroyed. Why? For lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Good lesson for us, isn't it? That thou shall be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Wow. All of us recognize that's, that's the thing that can hurt us the most. If you love your children, God says, you know what? If you do this, 
the punishment is more than you want. And yet after this, in Hosea 6 and Zechariah 8, it tells of the return of the remnant of, of Israel. Kind of like in Elijah's day, Elijah thought he was the only one, but he wasn't. There's always been faithful. There's always been faithful. Amos 8, verse 7. Amos 8, 7. And the Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. See, he uses this terminology both for good things and for bad things. Which works? Their sins. And yet we know he guarantees complete forgiveness if there's repentance. So does God really forget? Or does he just simply not bring it to mind? How did God handle Cain's evil heart? With a warning, with a rebuking. And Israel's, God would grant them forgiveness whenever they repented. Yet they failed, would fail again. Was Joshua right to tell Israel they were going to fail? Should we note it if someone appears to be headed towards sin? Careful there, right? We can't read the mind and the heart. Careful there. <clears throat> Jeremiah 31, verse 34. Jeremiah 31, 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. What? I thought it was being read. And every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Wow. So this is a kingdom prophecy after the resurrection, although day and night still exist, if you keep reading there. There's no need to remember their sin anymore. Does that mean God can't remember? I think his brain probably, you know, his ability to think probably exceeds that. <clears throat> Another one like this, Isaiah 43 and verse 25. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Fortunately for us, God desires us and wants us, and he is going to give us every benefit of grace and love. So he will not remember the sins. Does this mean God is not able to remember? Or just that he won't bring them up? It's a good lesson for us, isn't it? Isaiah 44, one more chapter to the right, and verse 22. Which says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Return unto me, that's an action. Paul the Apostle did that. Judas didn't appear to. He blotted them out. <clears throat> Ezekiel 18, verse 21. Ezekiel 18, 21. But if the wicked shall... We all know Ezekiel 18, right? Mike referred to it this morning. It's a wonderful chapter. It keeps us in line. Uh, God will repay righteousness completely. And this part says, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, so this is the worst case scenario, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. 
in his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Yeah. If we correct ourselves, they're gone. They're not mentioned. There was a man named Manasseh. He was a king. He was a very wicked king. Caused all of Israel to sin. And he fits this category. He repented at the last. What a wonderful story. Yet his sins are recorded in Chronicles and Kings both. And his repentance. And yet it says they shall not be mentioned. Well, they're not going to be held against him, are they? That's a, that's a great story. <clears throat> in fact, let's read a little bit of it in 2 Chronicles 33, verse 12. 2 Chronicles 33, 12. This is Manasseh, and he's been hauled off to Babylon for his sins. And so we read, And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. So he realized why he was in affliction, and he corrected himself. And we can read more about that, but let's skip to verse 18. Now the rest of the, verse 18, sorry. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh, and his prayer unto God, and the words of the seers that spake to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are written, in the book of the kings of Israel, his prayer also, and how God was entreated of him, and all his sin, and his trespass, and the places wherein he built high places, and set up groves and graven images, before, we, before he was humbled. Behold, they are written among the sayings of the seers. It is recorded. But he wasn't worried about that. He repented. But it is recorded. So how forgotten do these things get? Well, they're never mentioned again. <clears throat> New Testament. 2 Timothy 2.8. 2 Timothy 2.8. Which says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. I'd also like to read that from a newer version, which says, never forget, instead of remember, I, I don't know, I just like the way that sounds, never forget that Jesus Christ has risen from among the dead and is a descendant of David, as is declared in the good news which I preach. Never forget. We don't forget this. 1 John 1.9. First John 1 John 1.9, great verse, another one that I go to in my head often. If, we don't always like that word, but this is a great one. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I just want my sins to be forgiven. I want to be in the kingdom of God, eventually with God. Who knows everything? Nothing is hidden from God. And God's grace and mercy is absolute. It's an absolute guarantee, and it absolutely is there. So forgive and forget like God does. Thank you. Let's have a song. <clears throat>
All right, let's close our service today with song number 257. Dear Lord, forgive 257. Let's go ahead and stand. with a word of prayer. Our almighty God in heaven, we do thank you, Lord, for desiring us, for loving us first, for offering us the opportunity to be forgiven of our selfish ways, of our unloving ways. Help us, Lord, to always love and to move towards you and likewise toward that kingdom that you have promised us in your love. Forgive us when we fall short. Lord, be with all those that are in your need, those that we know and those that we don't. And again, Lord, we thank you for all things. In the name of your precious Son, Jesus, amen.